Hi, everybody. It's Trisha here, a president of the Virtual Foundry, welcoming you to today's webinar where we're going to talk about the basics of FFF 3D metal with filament. Now, FFF, as you probably know, stands for fused filament fabrication. Another um, a phrase that we use sometimes is FDM, fused deposition modeling, or BME, bound metal extrusion. There are a few different names for this same kind of uh, layering technology that we're doing with metal in the additive manufacturing in the metal additive manufacturing industry. But today we're going to focus on FFF metal and using filament metal uh, 3D printing filaments from the virtual foundry. So we'll walk you through the process that these filaments use. As an aside, the Virtual Foundry also produces glass and ceramic filaments uh, that work in a very similar way. So uh, we won't be focusing on those as much today. We'll really be centering on the use of the metal filaments, but that glass and ceramic is an option as well. I should let you know that today is January 24th, 2023. The time is 11.02 a.m. here in Southern Wisconsin, USA, and the temperature is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's an even zero degrees for you Celsius users, uh, totally appropriate for the middle of January. Now with me presenting today is Brad Woods, our founder, inventor, all around science guy. Say hello, Brad. Hi, everybody. So we're gonna get started right away with the agenda. So we'll give you some introduction, a little bit more background about Brad and me. Uh, what are FFF metal and filament? I'll give you a basic overview of that process. What are the equipment and supplies that you need to do the print divine center process? We're gonna look at some printing parameters and some troubleshooting helps. We'll also take a look at the debind and sintering process. We'll do an overview of those, again, with some tips, tricks, and troubleshooting there. Um, these will be, uh, it's a pretty quick overview. Um, and then we'll look at how FFF metal and filament compare to the other FFF metal AM processes on the market today. We'll talk through some ideal applications for this technology, and then we'll give you some help to get started, some resources and guidelines, and some really great opportunities to learn more about the process. So let's get started. Um, I introduced Brad to you a moment ago. Here within the Virtual Foundry, he handles everything that's about science, the filament itself, how it's made, how it's used, um, I'm Trisha, as I said earlier, and I handle everything about the business. So if you are writing in or calling into the virtual foundry, it's likely that you've heard back from me or our teammate, Austin. So FFF metal basics. It's a three-step process, print, debind, center. So the uh, filament materials, the 3D printing filament materials are made of metal powder, encased in a plastic binder. So during print, you're actually creating the shape and you're using that bound metal powder and you can see it in action on that video there. Uh, you're printing on a standard FFF 3D printer. So this is the step that gets the material into the shape that you want. The next step of this three-step process is debind. So when you are debinding, you're removing the PLA-like binder that the Virtual Foundry uses that holds that metal powder together. The picture below that uh, debind section uh, shows more of the sintering process setup. During sintering, now you've just got your metal powder. You're going to you're going to fuse the edges of each of those particles together, which is called sintering. So at no point is the metal powder melting into one piece. Rather, the little balls of metal are melting together at the edges, and there's still a little bit of space in between there. Now, on the left, you see a cup with some black stuff in it. So to prepare your part, 
for Debine and Center, you are loading it into a crucible. So that's what that picture is about. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a few minutes. So what are the equipment and supplies that you need to print? First of all, you need a 3D printer. Brad, talk to us about what kind of 3D printers work great for this material. Uh, pretty much any printer that will print filament will print our materials. We have users that use inexpensive ones on, so such as the Ender 3, which is, I think, selling for you know maybe two hundred and fifty dollars these days. They're incredibly inexpensive. Um, we do recommend that you get a direct drive unit and uh, and skip past the the Bowden tube. Uh, it just makes it a little bit easier, but you can definitely get started on pretty much any uh, filament-based 3D printer that you can find. Yes, great. So uh, you're really not limited to brand. The only true limits are those brands that require specific branded materials. So any right. 3D printer, any FFF, FDM style 3D printer that allows open materials or any brand of material will print filament as well. Right. On the low end, they tend to be open and nothing is locked down. Uh, a couple of years, somebody tried to market one that they sold through Best Buy and things like that. This was a machine that would be locked down. You can't use anybody's filament in it except for the manufacturers. So that's that's really the only exception. And the other items that you need, so you, uh, Brad mentioned uh, Bowden tube versus direct drive. Sometimes you can convert a Bowden type uh, Bowden tube 3D printer into direct drive. Um, but really you don't need to make any alterations to your 3D printer otherwise. Uh, the one thing that you want to use is a hardened steel nozzle sized at 0.6 millimeter, millimeter or larger. There are some 3D printer brands that make nozzle changing fairly difficult or they use nozzles that are specific to those brands. Uh, but for the most part, nozzles are pretty easy to come by. Right. The most common one that's a little bit more challenging is Ultimaker. They've switched to a print core strategy, but you don't need the gem tip nozzle from Ultimaker. Just the hardened steel nozzle uh, is, is adequate. Uh, also on the list here is a fill -a warmer, and you can see a picture of the fill -a warmer installed in the center here. Brad, talk us through what that fill -a warmer does and why it's important. Right, and what we found, so uh, the Virtual Foundry is in its seventh year, and our ongoing challenge has been to raise the metal content of the material without making it so fragile that it can't be handled for loading and working with it. And so the, what we found is we use this fill warmer, and all it does is it cycles up to about 65 C, and then it cools down to about 40 C, and it, it'll do this as the material's going through it. It relaxes the memory in the thermopolymers, so you know, they want to they want to be in a circle after being on that spool for a while. So this device doesn't melt it or anything like that. It just warms it up slightly, lets the uh, the thermopolymers relax, relax, and then it comes out straight. And it actually stays quite strong and bendable for about twenty four hours after it's gone through that fill warmer. So if you take a look at that photo in the middle, it's got the fill -a warmer installed. The fill -a warmer is the um, vertical tube with the hook on the top. You're installing that fill -a warmer so that the filament material comes off the spool and goes directly into the warmer. So the goal is to make the shortest distance possible from where the filament comes off the spool and where it enters the fill -a warmer. So sometimes you have to get a little bit creative with your setup. We have a few fill -a warmer installation videos on our YouTube channel um, and also some uh, another video that shows if you need to set up the fill -a warmer at the bottom of the 3D printer, for example, we have an example video for that as well. In this case, we can see that um, this setup will be above the 3D printer. So then we're making a straight line from the spool to the hot end of the printer. The other two things we need are blue tape, blue painter's tape. So this is standard blue painter's tape for your print bed. Filament will really stick to your print bed. So it's important to have some kind of 
release layer between your print and the print bed. There are a couple of exceptions to using blue tape, but blue painter's tape is a pretty good all around uh, release layer for working with filament. Mm -hmm. So those exceptions are gonna be if you have a glass print bed, like with the Ultimaker. In that case, um, you're using a little bit different application. We do have an FAQ video on our YouTube channel that explains that as well. It's pretty simple. Um, and then the last thing you need is filament itself. Um, the filament materials that are in stock all the time are uh, 13 strong. They range from bronze and copper to a few different kinds of steel, tungsten, aluminum, titanium, a couple different kinds of iron, and then some ceramics and a Pyrex glass. So those are the standard materials that the Virtual Foundry carries. You also have the option of custom filaments. So if you're interested in something that we don't typically carry, like a magnesium, for example, you can reach out and um, engage with us to make that for you. Filament uh, materials come in 1.75 and 2.85 millimeter diameters. They also come in pellet form if you are looking at a pellet fed 3D printer. So now we're gonna talk through the equipment and supplies needed to debind and center. First of all, you need a heat source and typically that's a kiln or a furnace. So Brad, talk us through that piece of equipment. Right. The kiln is, uh, it, it isn't special or uh, necessarily designed for the application that we're using here. Typically these come from one of two places. They're either uh, ceramics and glass in art studios or they're for heat treatment. And what's important about the kiln is that you have a programmable controller. We need to have a, a decent amount of control over the temperature, both uh, being able to ramp it over a period of time so we can program it to increase by uh, 200 degrees per hour uh, Fahrenheit up to a temperature of 900 and hold it for three hours. For example, That would be an example of a program. So Brad's talking about this being a pretty standard unit. You can source these from every, from anywhere just as you can with the 3D printers. We do offer three different kilns uh, if you just want an easy place to get one of those. So we have a couple of different sizes and a couple of different max temperature offerings. So we're talking here about open atmosphere, gas or vacuum, what's up with that? Well. The Virtual Foundry has created a process that allows you to do the debind and center processes in open atmosphere. And open atmosphere means there's no gas applied, there's no vacuum applied, it's just the regular air that's in the room is in the kiln. And we'll, um, as we continue through our list of supplies needed, we'll talk about why you don't need gas or vacuum. Although you can use gas or vacuum if you are familiar with those processes. So your kiln or furnace will need to be able to hold the maximum, I'm sorry, they will be able to, they will need to be able to hold the sintering temperature of the materials that you are working with for several hours. That's important. So when you're looking at the maximum temperature of a certain kiln, it should be about 50 degrees Celsius above the temperature that you want to hold your kiln at to give some room between the working temperature and the maximum temperature that the kiln lists. You're also going to need a crucible. So we'll, that will become more clear as we explain the process in a little bit more detail um, as we go through, oops, excuse me, as we go through. Um, a crucible and what material, we'll talk through that as well. You'll need a refractory ballast. So there are two things that need to happen during debind and center. One is that the part shape is supported. And the second is that during sintering, oxygen is prevented from reaching the part. So we solve for part shape support by using a refractory ballast. So you've got that crucible, you've got your refractory ballast material, you're burying your part in there, uh, going through your debind process, and then we're adding sintering carbon during sintering to manage the oxygen. So we're preventing the oxygen from reaching the part using that sintering carbon. 
And then we also list here a crucible cover and um, kiln paper, which is something that the Virtual Foundry offers. This crucible cover can be anything, kiln paper, a ceramic plate, tool, steel wrap, anything that can take the heat without changing. Now we've taken a look at the basic process. We've talked through the equipment and the supplies that you need. Now let's get into a little bit more detail with the process and talk about printing. Brad, walk us through the, the basic print settings that people should pay attention to. Yes, when setting up, we recommend people starting from scratch. You can find some of our profiles in Cura that are built in, check the marketplace if you're looking for a pre-configured uh, profile. But generally speaking, we just recommend that people set up for PLA, get it printing, and make sure that things are working well. Um, in fact, you know, do a practice print of the part that you're about to do in PLA just to make sure that everything is, is, is correct. And then switch over to the virtual foundry materials um, and two, two settings. Really one important setting needs to change, and that's the flow rate. So our material is quite viscous and more difficult to push through the nozzle than regular PLA would be. You know, as far as the viscosity, PLA will flow like, you know, thick paint when it's hot, and our material flows more like bread dough. So we compensate a little bit by exaggerating, exaggerating the flow rate. Um, nozzle temp 210, that's not uncommon for, uh, for PLAs. Um, the binder in our material is PLA compliant. I mean, it's nearly all PLA and it functions like PLA. So at no point, you're never melting copper or bronze, for example. You're just heating the thermopolymers that bind the particles together so that you can shove it through the pre 3D printer to, to get your shape. Generally speaking, people ask about infill. Our recommendation is that you use a 70% infill with at least three wall or three line print line widths to the outside of whatever is being infilled. So that's a general recommendation, um, but infill can be different depending on your parts needs. Uh, Brad and I did a podcast recently that goes into detail about infill, and that will give you a lot of information about when to use more, when to use less, and how to decide. So if you want more detail about selecting infill, take a look at, take a look at that podcast Otherwise, a great opening suggestion is the 70% with three walls lines. Uh, Brad, tell us about these pictures on this slide. What are we seeing here? Yeah, so making adjustments. So if you look, the first picture to the right, it has two, uh, two cylinders printed. The one on the left is under extruded. This is what would happen if you didn't exaggerate the flow rate to 135%. The one on the right half of the first image is properly, uh, has enough material flowing, it's working properly. And under extrusion is a, is a pretty common first time mistake that people make. But when you, if you look at this image, you'll be able to spot it right away. Um, the one on the left is under extruded, the one on the right is perfect. So the second cylinder, picture two, I guess we'll call it, that's an example of over extrusion. So in that example, it's laying down so much material that doesn't have any place to put it. So it all gets, it winds up getting pushed to the outside and winds up as, uh, you know, uh, unpleasant attachments on the outside of your print piece. Um, tell us a little bit about clogs too, Brad. Some folks um, ask us or write in with questions about a clogged nozzle. Um, and as we help through them, walk us through sort of the list of things to look for if it looks like your nozzle is clogged. Right. The number one example is that, um, and it can become clogged later, but it's actually that the nozzle is not clogged. Um, when it's useful to put a little bit more distance between the bed and the tip of the print nozzle on your first layer. And this goes back to the viscosity issue that I was talking about. And it's pretty common. People will go to print and it worked okay with PLA because it flows easily. 
when they switch to our material, like I said, it has the bread dough consistency. And effectively, it's the bed that's clogging the nozzle. And in time, this can become a, a real clog because it'll sit there and grind away at it. Generally speaking, just make sure the material is flowing easily. You can make adjustments such as, you know, raising the temperature or slowing it down. These are all things that can be tuned on the fly. And my general strategy is if I make an adjustment to a print that I'm doing on the fly, um, then I'll just sit down and quickly make the change to the slicer settings for when I go to the next piece. Yes. Um, thank you for mentioning the adjustments on the fly, because you can adjust the nozzle temperature yeah. and the flow rate. As you see your material start to come through the nozzle, it's laying down. You're starting to notice some under or over extrusion. You can adjust that flow rate in line and also adjust that nozzle temperature up and down to really dial in your best print parameters. Yes. Okay. Let's talk through that debining and sintering process. I did uh, briefly discuss it, uh, but to debind, you're going to bury your print in a refractory ballast in a crucible. Now, the refractory ballast is a sand-like material um, that won't be affected by the heat of the kiln, and it's going to support your part shape. So during debind, you're burying your print in that refractory ballast in a crucible. You're putting your crucible in your kiln and running the debind time and temperature profile. The debind time and temperature profile is listed on our website on the how to 3D print metal page. So you'll find all of these instructions there as well. For the sintering step, for some materials, copper and bronze in particular, you're going to take your debound print out of the kiln after it's cooled, dump it out, and then repack your brown or debound print into fresh refractory ballast in the crucible. You'll add some sintering carbon to manage oxygen and a light cover to reduce the amount of oxygen that that sintering carbon has to deal with. Putting the crucible in back into your kiln and running the center time and temperature profile. Again, time and temperature profiles for most materials are on our website. Um, Brad, tell us about some common um, Tell us about uh, some errors that can happen or when you take your part out from the debind process, um, if you see certain things, what clues do those give you? Right. So most uh, physical defects actually happen during the debind process. So in the two-step, the center one day, or debind one day, center the next strategy, it gives you a chance to look at your part, inspect it, make sure that's, that nothing's wrong, and then only center it if it's appropriate. But generally speaking, if there's an issue with the shape of your part, it's the debinding phase where, uh, where things will either warp or distort or something like that. And that's the and the reason that happens is from not packing the uh, refractory ballast around the part well enough. We're essentially burying your part in sand. That's the easiest way to think of it. We use AL, we use granular AL203. Um, but what you're looking for is packing in enough around it that it can't shift while it's going through the through the debine. There's a point during the debine where it's very fragile. You know, you could just take it and squish it, and it would be it would be all over. It's during this phase that the ballast needs to support the part. So a properly packed part will not warp or distort. And for tips on that, I recommend looking at how you, it's called ramming up a, a sand cast. Some people might be familiar with that. And you're literally just, you know, pounding sand in around your part, gently, of course. Oh, oh. What happens if you pull your part out at the very end of the sintering cycle and it's kind of black and crumbly? Right. Um, that means there was oxygen present during your debind cycle. So the black stuff is cupric oxide and, and it's not hard to spot. When a part comes out of the uh, out of the sintering step, 
it, it should look like the metal roughly that you're starting with. If it's stainless or something like that, it'll just be gray, but it won't look unhealthy. It'll, it'll look like nice clean metal. If your part comes out like a really, really dry cookie and crumbles in your hand, the number one reason that happens is that air got to the part during the sintering process. Materials like copper and bronze are considered base metals, and they want to attach to an oxygen molecule. And if it can find one, it'll do it. And if it finds one, or many, it, it'll damage your sintering process. And this is the purpose of the sintering uh, carbon that we put on the top. All that stuff is, it, it's activated carbon, highly purified, and it's intended to be sacrificial. So when the temperatures get high enough, any present oxygen will react with that carbon well before it has an opportunity to react, react with your metal part. So if you take a look at our website, you're looking at the instructions, you will find that some materials are listed as untested. Uh, we're going to talk about two of those today, aluminum and titanium. So both of these are reactive in the presence of oxygen and heat, and they both require special in environments in order to... Oh, I'm sorry, just a moment. They can't be, stand they can't be centered in standard kiln equipment. They require specialized environments. Right. So I was talking about how base metals like copper and such will uh, will pick up oxygen. Uh, the, it does it somewhat passively. It has to be there in order for it to happen. But aluminum, titanium, and everything else in this class, like magnesium, are considered active. And they, they're they much more aggressive about looking for that oxygen molecule. It'll actually remove it from the fire brick and, and things like that. So it's, a, it's a, just a different animal. The metal, <clears throat> uh, FDM metal is being done this way and it works, but it's not where anyone wants to start unless you're already centering aluminum titanium in your facility or something like that. It's, it's just a different animal. So now we're going to talk about an alternative to using a standard kiln. And this is microwave sintering. So microwave sintering is still in the experimental phase. Yeah. We did do a webinar about this, and it is on our YouTube channel if you want to look into more detail. So the basic process is the <clears> same. You're loading a crucible and running a debind cycle. You're loading a crucible and running a center cycle. So what's different is where the heat comes from. So Brad, walk us through that. Right. And it, it's also this, you know, greatly abbreviates the process. This is this is young, this is in testing. Um, I don't want people to get their hearts set on this, but it's so much faster, so much easier to do. And essentially what happens is, so the thing between the kiln and the text there is a microwave kiln. And really all it is is a fire brick. And then the black stuff in there is silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is an energy collector from microwaves. So you put the part on the inside of there, put that whole thing in your microwave, and the heat, the energy that comes from the microwave only heats the spot that you want it to, which is that black stuff. So you can control where it goes. There's all kinds of interesting options here. It's faster and you can hit temperatures that you can't hit with the kilns. So all of the kilns are used, they use resistive heating like your toaster does or something like that. And there's a physical limit of about 2,500 F where the materials just can't get any higher. So getting to the higher temp materials uh, and all the way up to tungsten, which is the highest melting point literally in the universe, it can, has been done this way on a commercial scale. And we're looking at how we can bring that to smaller shops. Hey, Brad, so what's special about that microwave? Nothing. That's what's cool about it. That's a $60 microwave from Walmart, or it, it could be a hundred. I'm not really sure, but it's just a regular microwave that you can go and buy at Walmart. So you do need to calibrate your microwave to figure out how it gets to the temperatures that you need. And there's a, a prescribed process for that where you, you're putting your microwave kiln, which is that container, into the microwave, running it on low power for five minutes, testing the temperature of the, the crucible item. 
run it another five minutes, test the temperature and so on. You'll do that at higher power and higher power. So that's how you calibrate your microwave to see what temperatures it can get to and what times. And that helps you with your ramp schedule and your centering time and temperature schedule. So again, very experimental in the earliest phases. Um, for more information, you can look at our, center, our microwave centering webinar uh, that we did last fall. And also take a look at Mr. Highball's YouTube channel. He's done the most public work on this process. He started with aluminum because he likes to do the hardest thing first. So you'll see lots of fails on there, but you'll also see a lot of experimentation and um, progress in the process um, that he's working. Yeah, this is truly in its infancy. I, we want to set expectations low. But if it works, it means that we can make a programmable microwave that essentially does the same thing as the uh, kiln controller. So we can program its ramp rate, center, et cetera. This is, this is exciting stuff. So how do you know what crucible material to use? How do you know what your centering temperature of your material is? Well, all of that is on the website on the How to 3D Print Metal page. So you're going to select a crucible type. Now, there are a few that we offer, alumina, graphite, and stainless steel. And you can see there, uh, alumina is recommended for all. It's a great material that lasts a very nice long time. Graphite is good as well. A thick graphite crucible may affect your time and temperature profile. So it could produce a little bit more heat than the alumina would. You might need to just make some adjustments to your time and temperature profile, not a big deal. Stainless steel will be good for a few rounds with bronze and copper, and it won't be effective for the steels. For the refractory ballast, the, re the sintering powders, refractory ballast, we call them a few different things. That also is prescribed here. Bronze and copper, are you using AL203 for debind, talc for sintering, and using sintering carbon during sintering to manage oxygen. The steels use steel blend for that ballast material, and again, sintering carbon to manage oxygen. So you've got your debind temperatures here, you've got your ramp times, the steels have a sub center temperature with a hold, and then your final sintering temperature. So there's another page on the website titled products, and that lists all materials and all sintering temperatures. This sintering chart comes from the how to 3D print metal page and just helps you understand these five materials and their processes more closely. And if you are looking to source a kiln, you will use these center temperatures to help guide you to a kiln that can handle holding these the center temperatures from the materials that you wanna work with. Next up is a comparison chart. So if you're wondering uh, if you've been looking at FFF metal additive manufacturing and you've seen a few different options out there and you're wondering how they compare to each other, this comparison uh, chart can help you out. So it's going, it describes the print equipment, debinding equipment and center equipment, the build volumes for each, the feedstock, mostly filament, the studio system two by desktop metal uses a rod shape, what slicer do you need? What is happening during debind? Um, do you need any PPE? What is the support material? And how much do the parts shrink during <clears throat> sintering? Now you'll notice for filament with the virtual foundry, we list the shrink as seven to 20%. That's a pretty wide range. What's up with that? If you're following the instructions on our website for copper and bronze, you can expect a 7% shrink which will give you an 80 to 85% part density. But look, you have control over every step of the process. So you can adjust your time, you can adjust your time and temperature profile to create a greater shrink, thereby creating a greater density. So if you allow your part to shrink more like 20%, your densities are gonna be much higher in the 90s. Second page of this FFF technology comparison chart now gets into what materials each technology offers, are custom materials an option, uh, what is the price of the system? So if you're going all in on the equipment, what's your initial outlay? And then the price for the consumable materials. 
In this case, only 17.4 was looked at because that is one material that all four companies offer. This comparison chart is on our website on the research and white papers page. Uh, we did also do a full webinar uh, comparing and contrasting the four different FFF technologies. So a greater, more detailed resource for you there if you are in the exploration phase. Now let's talk about applications that are great and some to avoid and Brad, uh, just go nuts here. Tell us everything that you uh, think will work great and things that people should avoid. Right. And most of the applications come to us from our users. So many of the things are things that we just we didn't think of. So we we put out a material with these properties, pick people pick them up and run. Um, on the research and innovate in research and innovation. So this is a huge sector for us. And what's interesting or what's important is that people are realizing that you can fabricate parts this way that you couldn't do any other way. So conversely, so parts to avoid, in my opinion, is um, things that are easy to access in another way or easy to fabricate in another way. That's not where this uh, technology becomes powerful. It becomes powerful when you start creating objects that you couldn't do in any other way. So on the bottom left is a four to one manifold. And this, you know, this would be pretty challenging to, well, to CNC, um, you could you could cast it, but there's many challenges there, but it's relatively easy to 3D print. So this is a, this is a very good example. Uh, radio, radiation shielding, this is a common use. Uh, our tungsten material is dense enough that it has roughly the same properties in its green state. Uh, at least as far as x-rays are concerned, as lead. So it's a non-toxic uh, lead, 3D printable lead replacement. Um, the, the second part, the one next to the four to one manifold, um, that's a collimator out of an x-ray or an MRI machine, not MRI, but x-ray. And at uh, each of those blades is at a slightly different angle. So fantastically difficult to fabricate otherwise, easy to 3D print. Uh, tooling. This is probably one of the easiest early applications of FDM metal. And that is uh, in, in, in tooling. There's an example where we did a project with Autodesk where we made a gripper for a machine, but the tips of the grippers were uh, made out of copper and had internal channels in them for running, uh, running a cooling fluid through them. So you could handle very hot items, things that you couldn't normally with something that's 3D printed. Prototyping, yeah, I think mean, that's a pretty, pretty obvious place where it works well, got the internal structure. General, generative design, this is, uh, here, hang on. So there's a few different words for this, like topological optimization, things like that. But basically, the idea is mathematically growing your parts. So you don't um, you don't draw your part. You lay out a basic description and then tell the software where the loads are, what the angle of the loads are, things like that. And you hit go, and it uses artificial intelligence to essentially grow it as if it were a tree or something like that. This is perfect for uh, uh, for FDM metal. It just brilliantly minimizes the amount of materials that are consumed uh, and 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 they look cool. But that's an interesting area that's gaining speed quickly. And I'll be putting some more examples of this on our website, things that we're generating or creating generatively. And then we'll, I'll publish some more examples, but this is going fast. Decorative items, that's a no brainer. Um, you can print, uh, for example, we have uh, at least one uh, museum in Italy where they're 3D printing replicas of the classics and things like that, and then they sell them in their uh, they sell them in their store. Those are amazing. Heat transfer, right? So, like, uh, um, 
like intercooling things like that any place you need to move fluids around or move one fluid in near contact with another in a heat exchanger or something like that those are ex excellent applications space and aerospace this um we have applications here and we have working up people working on things and just about every application you can think of so like if you go through the list of people that have bought stuff from us and you know it includes spacex and all the big ones and a couple of years i was actually years ago i was actually invited out to speak at lockheed martin which was a really cool experience um yeah space aerospace things to avoid the trailer hitch so this is the analogy that i use a lot of times people think oh 3d print metal and they'll print the first thing they think of is something that's just not practical to do this way so that would be a trailer hitch is the obvious one they're an expensive iron not costly to buy you wouldn't want to use an expensive complicated process to create something that isn't hard to come by um so under parts under great stress so at this point I mean this stuff is none of this and even very little of 3d printing even at the very very high end are qualified for you know mission critical applications this technology is just in its infancy it's gaining traction fast but it it, it needs some time for things to test out so we don't recommend that people use it in high stress situations or high risk situations um yeah the thicker and more bulky a part is the more difficult it becomes to 3d print and costly it gets, much, it gets more and more expensive as the part gets larger and heavier so you know be selective in the things that you want to do with it on the bottom left there the, under the generative part there is a, a bracket brackets are perfect tooling is perfect uh trailer hitches are not the space applications are my favorite. I love hearing about all the really cool, innovative things that people are thinking about in space. And it's an excellent example of how this brand new manufacturing method can be used to do brand new things. Um, if you're already making parts in other ways, maybe that part isn't well suited for this technology, but new stuff is great. Things that you just really couldn't do before. You're getting any metal into any arbitrary shape that you want. What kinds of innovations could you do with that? Hey, let's, so, uh, let's, Trisha, let's plug a product that we're bringing online in the next few weeks. Yeah, do it. And that is uh, 3D printable moon dust. Yeah. So this company uh, used this strategy as a method of developing for manufacturing on the moon using the moon dust that's already there. So it's a regolith uh, simulant filament, and it, it's the real deal. It's certified. It's it's uh, it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah. So you'll be able to print your own moon structures out of moon dust simulant. Right. It would be and really fun if we had actual moon dust, right. but we do not. Yeah, it's all simulators. Yeah, so this, the space applications are really fun. Uh, we listed research and innovation first for a reason. There are lots of students at universities and higher ed schools all over the world doing really cool research with uh, this fully hands-on metal 3D printing method. So with the Virtual Foundries Filament, you are getting a fully hands-on process so you can understand every step of what's happening. And you can also do more with the flexibility and control that the system offers. So this all sounds great. How do you get started? Well, we have some help for you to get started. And the first thing is an FFF Metal 3D printing course. Now this starts next month and it's a deep dive on everything that we talked about here. We're just gonna go into greater detail. We're gonna tell you everything that we know so that by the end of the course, you are an expert in FFF Metal and getting the perfect parts that you want. We're gonna supply you with the materials that you need as well. Not the hardware, but a kit of materials that you need so that you can do hands-on work as we go through the course. We're allowing, we're maxing out the course at 10 spots and those are selling. So if you 
Um, so you'll need to sign up quickly. The registration deadline is February 15th. The class begins the next day, February 16th. So there's going to be one more price increase on February 1st. So register now to get the lower to get the lowest price. And though that will be in person via Zoom instruction uh, with Brad, me, our teammate Austin, um, the experts in FFF Metal to give you all the detail that you need to make awesome, perfect parts. Uh, there will be lots of direct interaction. There will be homework. And for people that can't process parts on their own, they'll ship them back to us and then we'll we'll send them back. So it's and because you are. Nope. Oh, sorry, Brad. Nope. Oh, I just said it's very hands on. Other help for you to get started. We talked about the course. There's a page on our website titled Getting Started. That's going to give you a basic overview of the process, sort of what we've got done here today. Then also on the website, look at how to 3D print metal. That will give you the printing parameters and the D-bind and center instructions. Check out our YouTube channel. There is a wealth of information on there. Previous webinars, podcasts that break down specific topics in the process, how-to videos and some FAQ videos as well that talk through one question at a time. You can always write to us at info at the virtualfoundry.com for help. Your success is very important and we are here to help you be successful. Now you can also request a consultation and training package. So write to us at info at the virtualfoundry.com if you are interested in a package like that. And then finally, one I mentioned several webinars as we've gone through here today, but there is specifically the compare and contrast FFF metal webinar if you are in the shopping phase. We did get one question in, where do you advise to get a larger crucible? So you can look online generally for using words like sintering boat. That's going to be sort of like a meatloaf or a bread loaf pan shape. Um, and those will come in multiple sizes. We do also have a resource here. We have a vendor that's making custom larger crucible sizes. So if you're having trouble finding one online on your own, reach out and we can help you get a larger crucible. Thank you for asking that question. Does the orientation of the D-bind and center matter? Not the D-bind, yes, the center. And this can vary somewhat with the part. And But in the orientation of Z, you typically have uh, an extra, you know, maybe 2% shrink. Um, and like I said, this, this d depends vastly upon the part, depends on how tall it is, whether it um, is, but short answer, it does matter. And the Z in the crucible might not be the Z on your printer. Good Typically point. they're the same, but they might not be. So if you plan to orient your part differently in the crucible than it is on your printer, Keep in mind that the Z will be different in those two places. Right. But generally speaking, I'll calculate or expect an extra 2% shrinkage in the vertical due to gravity. So those top two items, the Discord server and Reddit, are places where our partner innovators can communicate with each other. Reddit is a more public forum. Discord is a little more private. But you can talk with other people using filament and um, ask them questions, get feedback on your projects, um, take a look at YouTube. I talked through that. We're also on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. If you are if you enjoy the social media, instructions can be found at how to 3D print metal on our webpage. Um, our shop is at shop dot the virtual foundry.com pretty straightforward and again you can always write to us at info at the virtual foundry.com any questions that you have um generally speaking we would we 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 encourage people to share their results if you get something interesting you know please put it back out to the community so that we can share 
And this is starting to happen at a bit of an industrial scale. And people are talking out on Reddit and Discord, things like that. There's places to share information and gather information. We published a regular, um, we published a regular podcast as well. And if you would like to show off your project via <laughs> podcast, um, an interview from me, I would love to interview you about what you have been working on. Brad, I do have one more very important question for you. All right. Did you hear about the new restaurant? It's called Karma. I have not. There's no menu. You just get what you deserve. Nice. Hey, thanks everyone for attending the webinar today. Uh, really enjoyed walking through the basics of FFF Metal with you. Any further questions, reach out. Info at thevirtualfoundry.com. You'll hear back from me directly or our teammate Austin, possibly Brad. Um, and we're happy to walk you through any part of the process. And do take a look at that course to help you get all the detail you need to make beautiful, perfect parts with FFF metal. Until, until next time, happy printing, everybody. Thanks, everybody.